This morning, the title uh, of the message is Live Today Where You Want to Be Tomorrow. And so even before we get started, just real quick, I wanted to, we're going to be reading out of uh, Matthew 25, and we're going to start in verse 11. So Matthew 25, starting in verse 11. But I just real quickly wanted to uh, make a, make a, just do a little teaching on this real quick. This, we're about to, two of these readings have to do with their parables. Their parables of Jesus. Okay, and so real quick, I just wanted you to know that the, where we get the word parable from in the Greek language uh, is from this word here, parable of. Now, I've told you before that Greek words are, are compound words, and many times there's like a preposition connected to it. So anyway, when you break down the word, sometimes just by breaking down the Greek word, you can gain a greater insight into what the meaning of something is. And so a parable... The word para means alongside. And the word below is where we get the word, kind of where we get the word ball because it means to throw. So basically, whenever we're looking, and, and this isn't anything new to most of y'all, but to some people it's new. So when we study a parable, what we need to understand is that things are being thrown alongside one another. And the reason why they're being thrown alongside is so that for the purpose of comparison and contrast, okay? So you can gain a greater understanding of the point that's trying to be made. And so in these two parables, uh, it's going to be the kingdom of God is likened <laughs> unto... So you could say the kingdom of God is as or the kingdom of God is likened unto. So when you look at the parables, if you can gain the essence of what's being said in the parable, it gives you a description of what the kingdom of God looks like. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, many times we get this idea that we're talking somewhere in the faraway sky in heaven. And that's true. God's kingdom, you know, in the, in the Lord's prayer when he said, you know, Father, uh, you know, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your name is holy. Your name is sanctified. Your name is separated from every other God. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is in heaven, yes, but the kingdom of God is also on earth. Amen. The kingdom of God is on earth living in you. Amen. How do I know? Because God sent his son Jesus, the very kingdom of God, the very presence of God, resident in Jesus. Amen. And when Jesus died and your faith was placed in that gospel plan, the kingdom of God entered you. Hallelujah. And so listen to me, though. Not only is there the kingdom of God on the earth, there's also the kingdom of the enemy. Right. The, the, you may not like to hear this. Well, I'm sure you don't mind, but there's people out there that don't like to hear this. They don't mind talking a little bit about God, but they get the eebie-jeebies when you mention the devil. But listen to me. If you believe the, that God is real, if you believe his word is real, there's an enemy of God. And th there's two kingdoms that coexist on this earth, okay? But what we're looking at today is, is, is that, listen, at least in these two parables, the kingdom of God is likened unto, okay? And so once again, this morning, the title of this morning's message is, Live Today Where You Want to Be Tomorrow, amen? amen. All right, well, let's take a look, and we're going to start reading in verse 11. Now, this might seem a little confusing, but I'm going to explain it. Because we're starting off at the end of the parable of the two virgins. It says, Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. All right, so we're going to continue that parable, the next parable in a second. So in this parable and the next one that we're going to read together, through these two parables, we're made aware of some of the things having to do with the kingdom of God. We're, we're giving an insight into concepts that, or at least the way that God sees his kingdom in the way that it's supposed to function. All right. And one of the things that we're made aware of in the parable of the virgins, you remember the story, right? There were five wise virgins. There were five unwise virgins. The Lord showed up when they really weren't expecting him. 
Now I can tell you that the scripture is clear that we will know the sign or at least the season. I'm telling you because the word of God says that just as you know the fig tree because you see the leaves that you know that that time is near even so. And so the point is, is that the, really the earth is ripe, in my opinion for the Lord to return right now where we are. The Lord, the, the earth is ripe for the Lord to return. I think we're in that season. There's no question in my heart. I believe Amen. that. Yeah. Amen. Uh, we're in the last days. I believe we have to be preaching the gospel and reaching the lost. Amen. In the midst of all of that, though, there were still in those with those virgins, five that were prepared, five that were unprepared. They all knew that he was coming back, but yet five weren't really ready. And because of that, the result wasn't where they wanted to be. Live today like you want to be like where you want to be tomorrow was the moral to that right there. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> decisions that okay, so that what that's what we see. That you know what decisions that are made today are going to affect tomorrow. All right. A common theme also that runs through the, uh, the the scriptures is that God's people believe He's coming back. Amen. Amen. That He has a master plan. That He's coming back, and that that belief affects our daily lives. Yeah. And we don't do everything right, but the Lord knows that if you truly love Him and His Spirit resides in your heart, you want to live for Him and you want to make decisions. That are, that are proper for his kingdom. Amen? Amen? In the parable of the virgins, we're introduced at the idea that some were ready and others weren't when he returned. Then the next parable is the parable of the talents. Because he will return. Amen. He's going to return. I'm telling you, this is not a sci-fi movie. I don't care how smart you are, how much science you study, the Lord is coming back. Amen. And in the parable of the talents, we're told he's coming back. But not only that, he's going to settle accounts. When he comes back, he's going to settle accounts. And he's going to look at the work that his people did. And he's going to determine the motives that were behind the work. Amen. He's going to search the hearts and the motives that were behind the work that took place. So let's start reading in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man. Now, you got to look, you got to insert Jesus right there. Okay, I'm just trying to help you out with understanding the parable. Right now, you got to insert Jesus. He's the man traveling into a far country. What are you talking about? Jesus came to this earth. He represented the Father. He died on the cross. He resurrected from the dead. He ascended to the Father. He traveled away to a far country. There's an absence, a period of time where he's no longer here. He's the master of this earth. Amen. We're talking about a we're talking about a, 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 an owner here who's going to entrust uh, certain aspects of his kingdom or what he owns to people, but he's going away on a journey. All right, he's traveling into a far country, and before he did, he called his own servants. That's us. Well, originally it was the disciples, but listen to me. You're a disciple this morning. Listen, if you are a born-again Christian, you are a disciple. Don't get the picture of Paul and Peter with the little halo behind their head out of your mind thinking, listen to me, don't laugh because, I, well, you can't laugh, but I used to think that too. I would see this picture of the little halo behind their they, that's, that, that is That is a cult. That's a cultic. That whole preparation, that's a sun disc. That's another God. We're not going to get into all of that. That whole purpose is to try to make us think that the disciples were at some level that we could. They were men. They were men saved by grace, man. Yeah. Peter denied Jesus. Okay. Paul, before he became saved, uh, you know, had Christians killed. All right. Uh, Paul still got angry. He told Barnabas, he said, your little nephew you don't need to come on the trip with us because he failed us the last time. He can't be trusted. All right. And yet later on, young Mark was very valuable to the kingdom. So, so the point that I'm trying to make is, is that, is, and listen, you're a disciple. The word disciple literally means a learner of Christ. There were original disciples, but we're also disciples today. And so, listen, it says that you called his own servants. That's you and I. That's the disciples. Amen. And he's entrusting to his servants certain things. That's what it says. And he delivered unto them his goods. He trusted them, trusted us to represent him and his business on earth. Does that make sense? This master is going on a long journey. He says, hey, servants, come to me. I'm going to entrust you with my business while I go away for a period of time. All right. And unto one, he gave five talents. Now, listen, for us to understand the parable, talent in, in this story is a money. 
is some type of form of money in the ancient times. But what you need to understand is, is that it's a perfect translation in the English language because even though it's kind of outdated to some extent, it works for us today because really and truly the allegory behind the story is that God's giving us gifts and abilities, talents, in order to be utilized in the kingdom of God. He's entrusting us with those gifts and talents to be utilized in the kingdom of God while he goes on his long journey so that we would handle his business. Amen. Amen. I remember this book I read one time. And it talked about brands. I can't remember what the title of the book was, but it talked, and I might have mentioned this to you before, but it talked about Levi Strauss and how uh, whenever they were building the railroad that connected the east to the west, that, uh, that Levi Strauss came out with those blue jeans back then. And, and one of the things of the blue jeans was that it had them copper rivets in the side there. And part of that purpose was is that these, these jeans weren't going to tear apart. And that's how Levi Strauss made its name. They said th- th- these, these jeans were durable for the work that it required on the railroad. Well, guess what? You can't say that your jeans are durable and can, and can endure. And then, you know, within the first week, they start unraveling at the seams of the pockets start falling off. In other words, if the, in order to properly represent the brand of what it's saying, it has to function appropriately. Right. Amen. Same thing goes on for God's servants. He's, he's entrusting them to handle the kingdom business. You and I are representing him upon the face of the earth. Amen. And so therefore, what we represent, it has to line up with what it is that he's asking his people to do. All right. He says, and straightway he took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same. In other words, he, he conducted business with those five talents and he made them other five talents. So he gained double the amount that he was given. Likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. He was given a little less, but he also doubled it. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and he hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants comes and he reckons with them. He came back and it was a reckoning. And so he that had received five talents came and brought the other five talents and said, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me Two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. So he just gave him back what he had originally been given. His Lord answered and said unto him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers. And then let me just try to give you an example of all that. What are you talking about? You reap where you didn't sow. Well, to sow means to throw seed in the ground. To reap what you didn't sow, that means somebody else threw some seed in the ground and you ended up getting a harvest. To harvest what you didn't straw, I'm not exactly sure what straw has to do, but it has something to do with the harvest process, the separation between the two. All right, this is an example. Gowdy was sharing with me on the phone, uh, or yesterday when we were talking, uh, we went, we took a ride, and one of the things that he was explaining, he said, Matt, it's happening so fast in Mexico, we can't even keep up with it. He said, dude, I'm telling you, every week, people, 30, 25 people getting saved. The parking lots in the hospital are full. They go to preach the gospel, and 30 people come up and they give their life to Jesus. He said, but it's even bigger than that. He said, it's so big that people that are getting saved, they're not even from this area, or else they'd go be going to remote church they go back to where they're from oh I got the goosebumps and he said one and they're witnessing like he said somebody in a drug cartel just got saved from somebody else that got saved in the parking lot over there and and the point that I'm trying to make is you knew that I was a hard man you knew how I could 
conducted my business and I reaped where I didn't sow. The point is, is that if we would allow the gospel business to be handled the way that it is and that it's supposed to and allow the light of God to, to move through us, then what ended up happening is, is that there would be a harvest. There would be production that's supernatural that you and I can't even imagine. In other words, God's saying, I'm looking for some productivity, not in your own strength. He's not asking you to do it in your own strength. You can't accomplish the work of God in your own strength. If you try, you'll mess it all up. But at the same time, if you trust the Lord and you do it the way that he's asking you to do it, then there's going to be a pro there's going to be a reaping of production. But this last servant, he just went and dug the towel. He didn't do anything with what God had given him. He just dug it in the ground. I didn't purposely come here because I wasn't even thinking about this to pick on anybody or to poke anybody in the eye. But guess what? God's given each and every person in this place gifts and talents, sometimes multiple gifts and talents. Amen. And God wants us to use. sometimes the gifts and talents God has given you. You don't even want to use them. Why? Because it's kind of halfway irritating to you. That's OK. We'll get into that a little bit more as the message goes on. It's a little bit irritating to you because you just don't want to have to deal with that kind of thing. Whatever the aggravation may be. Well, guess what? Nobody always likes every aspect of what they're doing for the Lord. Sometimes the work of the Lord is hard. Some, it's not always easy. You can't just always do what it is that you want to do. Just do the good stuff, the fun stuff. No, the work of the Lord is hard Amen. work. Amen. And sometimes you got to endure. Sometimes you got to dig down. And yes, like daddy said, you got to pull yourself up by the bootstraps with the grace of God and continue to it's move good. forward Amen. to do kingdom business. Amen. Amen. Sometimes you just got to stay. Up. No, and, and listen, sometimes people, other people aren't stepping up. So, so we have to step up and to do the work of the Lord. Amen. He says, I reap where I sow not, gather where I have not strawed. You ought therefore to have put my money to the exchangers and then at my coming, I should have received my own with usury. In other words, I would have made some money on my money. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. Now that's a word for people to know. If you're going to live your life today where you want to be tomorrow, you need to understand that the decisions you make today, the actions you live in this temporary life are going to affect your position in eternity. Mm. Yep. All right? I need you to understand that. That's really what this whole message is about. <clears throat> today matters for tomorrow. Yep. Amen? And, and praise God. For unto everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that has not shall be taken away even that which he has, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, at the same time, I don't want to preach this wrong. And I want to tell you, yeah, you know some of y'all, y'all are y'all are already feeling convicted. You ain't working for the Lord like you're supposed to. You're going to end up like the unprofitable servant with weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can't work yourself into the kingdom of God. That's not what this is saying. But what I will tell you is this. Is that a true servant of the Lord is going to have a desire in his heart to do the work of the Lord and to be productive for the kingdom of God. Amen. What we're seeing here is the result of a person that was not truly a servant of the Lord. And, did, and you squandered everything that God gave him and never did submit and surrender to what God was calling. You can, we can have excuses all day long. Right. I mean, can we be real with one another? Yeah. We can have excuses all day long. Or why we didn't do whatever it was that God wanted us to do. But the reality of it is, is this, is that one day the vapor's over, one day the temporary's over, and then we're beginning eternity, amen? And I don't know about you, but I want to make sure that I did what I was supposed to do for the Lord because I believe it's real, amen? Yes, amen. You believe it's real? You believe? I know you do, or you wouldn't be here this morning, amen? Especially if you've been here once before. All right. So the title of the message is truly played out in this passage in the sense that the way they lived while their master was gone determined their lot when he returned. You know, I said before we got started that the music showed me that this was the right message. It may not be, like I said, the best message we ever preached. You might not even like the message. But in one of the songs, they talked about redeemed, being redeemed. And another one of the songs, can you go to Revelation 5, verse 9? And another one of the songs, redeemed. Another one of the songs, ransomed. Talked about ransom. And the last song, it talked about the kingdom. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel. King of kings, Lord of lords. He said uh, that we're going to rule and reign with him forever, essentially, is what the song says. I forgot the lyrics. But, but it, we're gonna rule, and I'm going to rule and reign with him. All of those songs 
fit into my message and the essence of what my message is this morning. And I didn't have a discussion with nobody about it. That's what I love yes. about the, when the Holy yes. Spirit is behind something, yes. you get a confirmation. So somebody, maybe it's just for me this morning. I'm going to be honest with you. I'll preach this message to me just as much as I'm preaching it to you this morning. Amen. And so maybe it was all for Matt. Maybe it was, it was all to remind him of what he needs to do. But I want you to see in Revelation 5, 9, and 10, because I'm connecting this back to the parable of the talents. It says, and they sung a new song. Now, this is in heaven. We're seeing a picture in heaven. And we're seeing the elders uh, that are in heaven. That I believe if this is a pre-raptured church, this represents the church raptured in heaven. A pre-tribulation rapture. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book. Talking about the lamb. We're talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Remember, nobody was worthy. John started to weep. No, why are you weeping? Because nobody's worthy. There's not a man in heaven or on earth that's worthy to open the scroll. Don't weep. The line of the tribe of Judah is right there. He's Amen. worthy. He said, they, and they sung a song. You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. That means to start judgment on the earth. Why? I'm going to tell you why. Because you were slain and you have redeemed us to God. All those people in heaven that, that are up there worshiping him. The reason why is because you have redeemed us. What does that mean? We were slaves and you bought us back. We were slaves. We were sold into slavery through our first birth in Adam. We were slaves to sin, but God had a plan and he sent a ransom payment. He sent his son Jesus, hallelujah, to shed his blood, to pay a payment for the sin of mankind because the life of the creature is in the blood and it required untainted, sinless blood to pay the payment uh, for the penalty of mankind and this is what you, this is the result of it you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred every tongue and people and nation yeah. all over the place from China to India from India to South America from South America to Tampico Mexico to Morgan City Louisiana all kindreds all tongues all tribes all yeah. nations yeah. global you're a global God and you wanted people from all over the world to be redeemed Redeemed by the blood of your precious son to accept the ransom price that you paid, that you sent. Hallelujah. And if they just would have believed it by faith, if they just would have heard your true gospel message and believed it by faith, hallelujah, they would have been brought into the kingdom of God. And they would have been, they would have been set free from their slavery. Yes. They would have received the truth of the gospel. And... You have made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth, and we shall reign with him. Amen. I know that that was completely off the melody. I really tried, but you get the point. Can you sing that verse for me real quick? Can you just say it? What's that verse? Uh, all hail King Jesus, and we will reign with him. How's it go? And forevermore I will reign with him. Yes. And forevermore I will reign with him. Eternity. There you go. And throughout eternity, I'll sing his praises. And forevermore, I will reign with him. Right now is the temporary. How I live today is going to help. Live today where you want to be tomorrow. Right? This is temporary. There's an eternity coming. Hallelujah. And forevermore, I'm going to sing his praises. And we're going to rule and reign with him. I want you to understand that. That's the talents. That's the parable of the talents. He said, you have been faithful in a few things. Now I'm going to make you a ruler over many things. How you handled your business while I was away on my long journey, when I come back to settle accounts, then now this is going to affect your future during the time frame known as the millennial reign of Christ. I keep going back to that stuff. I can't help myself because I talk to so many people that don't believe this might sound like a science fiction movie to you, but Jesus is coming back again. And he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And all nations are going to bow down to him. Amen. And there's going to be some type of a system where you and I are going to rule and reign with him. I can't tell you exactly what it looks like. I can infer from the scriptures, but I can't prove it with one specific scripture. But I can tell you that from the knowledge that I've gained from the scriptures, there will be a hierarchy of some sort based upon the parable of the, of the talents and also based upon the parable of the sower, the seed that fell in good seed produced different types of harvests, that there will be a hierarchy in the millennial reign of Christ. This is how I envision it, okay? This is Matt's opinion 
on what we see in the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus is in Jerusalem, physically ruling from the throne of David, and all nations are coming to Jerusalem to pay homage to him. And the whole world recognizes that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and now the pervasive spirit over the land is no longer the spirit of Antichrist that's influencing people to go the wrong way. It's the spirit of God to the point where a child can play by an adder, which is a poisonous snake's hole, and not be hurt. To the point where a lion eats straw like an ox. To the point where a lamb and a wolf would lie together. That's what it says in the book of Isaiah. The millennial reign of Christ is going to be a time of peace. Amen. And I don't know what it looks like, but there's a possibility. Probably Gaudi will be the president of Mexico. I'm pretty sure that that's the way I'm just trying to say. Now, that's not how it's going to work out. Something like that. And probably, I don't know, Manuel, you might be the, the, the governor of Louisiana. I don't know. And you know what? One of y'all might be the mayor of Morgan City. And maybe, hallelujah, if God gives me the grace, maybe one of us could end up on a council somewhere. My point is this, is that in some way, shape, or form, we're going to have positions, and the, the positions are going to be uh, directly affected by what we did today, by what the talent and the gift, the abilities that God gave us, and how we utilize them for the kingdom while he was away. He's entrusting us. You know, the beautiful thing that I look at it, and this is maybe a poor analogy, but, you know, it's kind of like sometimes they say that why are they even playing this game, right? I mean, you got one team that's superior to the other team. I don't know. You got the Patriots playing the, the Browns. Why are they even going to play this game? The Patriots are going to play the Browns. Why, why are they playing this game? Because they played. That's why they play the game, because you never know what's going to happen. In the kingdom of God, Jesus already won the battle. The word of God teaches us that. In Colossians 2.14, the Bible says that he triumphed over principalities and powers. He already defeated the kingdom of Hallelujah. darkness. Amen. But why does he allow? Because he does it for us. He allows us to partake in the day-to-day -day actions of the battle during this time frame of humanity so that we can also partake of the eternity that he has prepared for us. Amen. I hasn't seen. Ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Amen? Amen? And so God's plan was that people would choose him by faith and then they would rule with him. Amen? And that they would understand that they were sold out of slavery. Hallelujah. That's right, Shep. Come on, brother. Preach it with me. <laughs> that, they would, that they would rule and reign with him. And that how we live today is we need to live today where we want to be. Tomorrow. Amen. 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 So the original parable we covered showed that there were three people who surely thought that what they were doing was what God wanted them to do. Amen. I mean, that guy that buried that talent in the ground, he really thought he was doing something right. Do you not agree? I mean, he wouldn't have done it. He, he was so happy. He said, Lord, I knew you were shrewd. Look, I got your talent for I saved it. I didn't lose it. Okay, but, but that wasn't what the Lord was asking him to do. Amen? Uh, and, and so, but he thought he was doing the right thing. And so we see in there that, that all three of them felt like they were doing the right thing. And so, uh, therefore, today's message has much to do with examining our own walk with God. Amen? That's really what the essence of today's message is. Examining our own walk with God. Not really your mama's walk. Not, nothing specific on you, mom. Just saying. Not your mama's walk. Not your neighbor's walk. Not the person next to you walk. Your walk. My walk. Our walk with God. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. We're going to take a look at something the Apostle Paul wrote. It says, uh, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, one thing that I want to point out, uh, I'm not going to probably give you the exact definition right now, but I want you to see steward in a very similar fashion as we saw servant in the last passage, okay? Stewards and servants oftentimes are pretty much interchangeable. I mean, a steward is certainly a servant anyway, right? There's different types of servants. A steward is a specific type of servant. But I just wanted you to see that that's a connection between the last passage. All right. Stewards of the mysteries of God. We'll talk about what the mysteries of God is in a second. But moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Amen. God's looking for the faithful. 
But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yeah? I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels. That word counsels right there, literally, if you look at the context in the Greek, it means purposes and intents. All right? We're talking about motives. God's going to determine the motives of the hearts. Of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Now, first thing I want to tell you is that where Paul says, he says, no man can judge me. I don't want you walking in here next Sunday. Please don't buy one of them shirts that says nobody can judge me. Only God can judge me. That's not really what Paul's saying. He is saying that, but look, God is going to judge humanity. Most of the people that walk around with them shirts on are wearing those shirts because of the fact that they ain't really submitted themselves to the gospel and they live in their life in the old way that they want and they don't want anybody calling them into question. Listen, God's going to judge everyone and you're either going to be judged based Based upon the fact that you're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, or you're going to stand naked before him. If you've rejected Jesus, judgment is going to be ugly. Amen. But if you've accepted Jesus, you will, your sin was judged on Jesus at the cross. Amen. All right. So in this passage of scripture, I just want you to know that the underlying context of the letters that were written to the church of Corinth, there's an underlying context that doesn't necessarily jump off the page. But one of the reasons, main reasons for the writing of the letters had to do with the fact that there were traveling ministers that were coming in and that were calling into question Paul's validity as a, as a prophet or a preacher and also the validity of his message. And really what he's talking about here, the validity of his stewardship, how he's handling the gospel. All right. And so this is his response. Now, what he says right here, he says, he says, let a man so account of us. Now, that word account literally means uh, to take an inventory, right? To scrutinize, to determine, to look deeply within, to separate it out, to take it in and see what's going on in there, right? And so he's saying, I want you to take an account of what? Of us as ministers of Christ and whether we be stewards of the ministries of God. Now, this word steward, I like this word. I like these words, right? <coughs> Oikonomos. Now, really what I want you to see is this right here, because this word here, oikos, it means house. So this particular type of steward is one who resides over or oversees a house. All right? So what Paul's using, that, like the parable of the talents, the kingdom, the master gave talents to his servants to monitor the kingdom while he was gone or to monitor his property while he was gone. Same thing, house steward. Paul's looking at the kingdom and the message that he's preaching as the house of God that he's been entrusted to take care of, if that makes sense. Now, now one of the things that I, I meant to put right here was, was that the Lord is going to return. So, be, so that's an you know, that's not supposed to be an M. So be ready, right? And then the second thing was that he's going to, he's going to, he's going to reckon and accounts. In other words, he's going to settle accounts. That's probably what I should have said. I'm using old King James language there. He's going to settle accounts. He's going to return, so be ready. And then number two, that's what we got from those two uh, parables that we talked about. So this is a steward, a steward of a household. And so Paul's saying, I want you to, to do a determination. I want you to look on the inside. You need to take an inventory. You need to scrutinize. You need to find out whether or not we are truly ministers of the mysteries of God. So much of the underlying, and we've already discussed the context of Corinthians. Take this examination. Now, he says a steward of what? The mysteries of God. And the mystery of God, i got to tell you, is the message of the cross. Amen. Amen. The mystery of God is the message of the cross. I'm about to prove it to you. Why? Because I want you to understand what I'm trying to tell you. I'm about to slow it down. This may be old stuff for you, but this is just one example. I'm going to use quick, three quick scriptures to show you how... This is just three scriptures. I could pull, I could sit here for literally hours and keep you here showing you scripture after scripture in various ways, shapes, or forms to prove the point that I'm trying to make. 
But I'm just going to try to make this point with three simple scriptures that come right out of the mouth of God that the mysteries that Paul was talking about had to do with the message of the cross. All right. We've discussed this. We've studied this. We've preached this multiple times. What do you mean by the message of the cross, preacher? The message of the cross simply stated is this. Mankind is separated from God because he's born of Adam and he's born in sin. Because of his sin, he cannot access the presence of God. God has a plan. God's plan was to bring forth Messiah, which we now know was Jesus the Christ. Amen? And that, that in that plan, he would be the sinless one that would pay the penalty for man's sin. All of that with the calling of Abraham before there was ever a nation called Israel, all of that with the making of a nation called Israel was for the purpose of giving us Jesus to the whole world so that Jesus and his sinlessness would die on the cross and that when we heard that truth and put faith in it, now the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, would come to live in us and there would be a communion between us and and God, and we could receive the grace of God, the strength of God, in order to live for God in this temporary por portion known as life. Amen. That's the message of the cross. Yeah. A message of redemption, a message of change, a message of power, a message of forgiveness. Hallelujah. That is the message of Calvary. A message where something dies so that it might live again. A message that says there's resurrection power connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's the message yeah. of the cross. That's the whole Bible. The whole plan, the whole history of God all resides. Is there healing in the Bible? Yes, but not without the message of the cross. Yeah. Is there prosperity in the Bible? Yes, but not without the message of the cross. Is there a prayer in the Bible? Yes, but you can't really pray if you don't have access to God. Now listen, there's a lot of people that don't really understand the message of the cross, but yet they're saved. They understand the cross in the sense of salvation. See, really and truly, a lot of times, just to try to explain this to you a little bit, when we say, oh, there's a lot of people that don't understand the message of the cross. Okay, well, that can kind of make you sound a little superior. So you need to slow down a little bit. You're not trying to explain. What, what are you talking about, preacher? I've been hearing the cross ever since I was a kid in Sunday school. My preacher always preached the cross. Yeah, but hold on a second. A lot of people preach the cross as it regards salvation. Right. Amen? In other words, you were born of Adam. You were born in sin. And so therefore, Jesus had to die for your sin. And if you'll accept that, then you get to go to heaven and live for eternity. Amen? But where, they, where, where the road diverges is in the sense of how do we live for God today? How do we become a good servant of the Lord? How do we become a good steward of his house? How do we become a steward of the mysteries of God? How do we live out this daily life? Amen? For God. Well, the same way that you received him. The, the, the word of God in the book of Colossians chapter 2 verse 6. You don't have to go there. But it says the same way. Yeah, go there. Colossians 2 6 real quick. Sorry. Colossians 2 6. Let's go ahead and just look at it. This is a rabbit trail, by the way. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. What does that mean? Did anybody want to throw their hand up? You accepted him. That's right. The, the same way you accepted him. How, what, what did it look like for you when you accepted Jesus? Where were you? Yeah, you don't have to all holler it out. But I mean, you know, I've told my story many times. If somebody wants to tell their story, where did you first hear about Jesus? Somebody just throw your paw on Come on. Sitting in a truck with my drunk friend. Sitting in a truck with her drunk friend. Everybody's got a story in here, right? Sitting in a truck. And you remember where you were. Somebody told you about Jesus. And you might not have. Maybe you accepted him right there. And if you did, hallelujah. You go like, yes, I did. And I ain't going back. Amen. But you know, I got to be honest with you. That, I mean, I didn't accept Jesus the first time I heard about him. As a matter of fact. Oh, man. Well, I, don't, I probably shouldn't tell that story. I don't have that much time. But I'm going to tell you. My sister showed up at our house when I was 13. I don't know if you remember this or not, Mom, but and let me tell you something. You won't play around with that crazy occult stuff because stuff like this will jump on you. But my sister showed up at my house when I was 13 years old, and I loved God. I'm telling you, I prayed when I was a kid. But anyway, she started talking about Jesus. Dude, she talked about Jesus so much, man, my ears were ringing with Jesus when she left. And I can remember laying down in my bed because I'd pray every night. This is before I got real bad. I was already stealing people's bicycles and dipping snuff and stuff like that. But it was before I got real bad. And I was laying down in my bed and I was praying. And I was like, Lord, I bet she don't even love you. 
Because I had never seen anything like that before. It was just freaky. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I bet she don't even love you. I bet she loves the devil. And when I said that, dude, I'm telling you right now, something jumped on my chest. And I could not move. I, it was like the blood was, my heart was beating out of my chest. It was like the blood was rushing so fast through my body. My ears were ringing and I started freaking out. I wasn't scared as much as a 13 year old kid, but I'm telling you right now, I had the fear, the fear grip my heart. And I was just thinking, I can't even move. And all of a sudden I just started to whimper. It was a whimper. It wasn't even a whisper. Jesus. I didn't know what else to call him. I said, I did something wrong. And she kept saying, Jesus, I better say his name. Jesus. And then I was able to say it a little bit, Jesus. I was able to say it a little bit louder. And let me tell you, finally that thing just left. Hallelujah. And I was able to sit up. And I'm telling you right now, it was like, dude, that was some crazy stuff. I told my mom the next morning, something happened to me. She's like, baby, you should have woke me up wake you up. I couldn't even get up out the bed. Anyway, praise God. Listen, you know the story. That was my story. When I, I didn't. My point to that was I did not receive him or accept him on that night the first time I heard him. As a matter of fact, she had to tell me many times. I remember riding down the road with her. Cynthia probably remember she was in the back seat. And then big old cars that Debbie used to drive. And she put in these tapes of testimonies of people getting saved and people getting healed. And I could just remember, man, my eyes getting all big thinking, man, this stuff's real. God's real. And I'd go to church with her. But all that, I still probably seven years before I really bowed my knee to the Lord. But you remember the day you accepted him or you received him was the day that you put faith in him and you bowed your knee to him. That means the day you got saved. Yes. Well, look what it says. Well, whenever you got saved, so walk you in him. Not just the day you got, how did you get saved? You put faith in Jesus and what he did for you at the cross. Bad news. If he, if he didn't realize you were a sinner and if he didn't repent of your sin, you're not saved. The modern church says you don't have to realize that you were a sinner or repent of your sin. Well, guess what? You got a whole bunch of people that through osmosis or whatever they're doing, sitting next to somebody, talking like they're a Christian, don't cut it. You got to give your heart to Jesus. You got to realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And then once you're saved, the same way you received him is the way that you continue to walk in him. How do you walk in him? Daily faith in the same thing that you believed on the day that you got saved. Yeah. This isn't rocket science. Hold on a second. How do you walk in him? Daily faith in the same thing you believed when you got saved. Oh, what are you saying? All I got to do is believe and then I can do it. No, 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 no. As you continue to walk and believe in the same gospel that saved you, the same grace that transformed your life on that day continues to strengthen and empower you on this day, the next day, the next day, the next day in order to live for the Lord. And the difference is it's the grace of the Holy Spirit strengthening you and giving you the power and the ability to do what God is calling you to do and not you just hunkering down trying to get it done through legalism and law and rules and regulations because you can't do it in your own willpower or your strength as much as you want to. I'm not saying that when you haven't found the grace yet that you don't still run the other way. I'm not saying you don't try to do what Joseph did. I'm not saying that. I remember Kirk Cameron, fireproof whenever the, the old boy had a problem with porn. Remember that? And I can remember when that, I'm so critical, dude. I'm telling you, Lord Jesus, please have my critical spirit. But he, but he did. He took that computer outside and he took a bat, baseball bat and started beating. I'm like, that ain't going to set you free, brother, because wait, you got to go to Walmart tomorrow and old girl's going to be over there and she's going to be looking nice and you're going you're, you're gonna to have that porn flick in your head because you ain't set free. But guess what? At least he was trying. And my point is some people just go ahead and submit to it. Oh, well, I can't get free. I'm just going to go ahead and relinquish myself to the sin. No, at least he was trying. But guess what? I'm here to tell you, you don't have to do it through willpower. You, don't get me wrong. You should have self, the, the, the self-control of the Lord. But, but grace. Continue to walk in Him. Faith in what He's done allows grace to flow into your Amen. life. To strengthen Amen. you. To give you the freedom and the liberty. Amen. That you need to walk with the Lord. Alright. That's important for stewards of God. That's important for servants of God. As they're, so we're talking about the mystery of God. And I was supposed to give you three scriptures real quick. That proved that this is talking about the message of the cross. John chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. Or at least that the mystery. So you know why it's a mystery? <coughs> it's not as much a mystery for you. I mean, you received this pretty easy from me. Because why? Because you're saved. And some of you have been studying the Bible like I have for years. 
That's easy for us. But for them in Paul's time, this was new. They had been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for Messiah to come. And now Paul's saying the wait's over, man. Boo, whatever. Jesus has come. The answer is here. It's already been accomplished. And you Jewish people that are rejecting it and refusing it, you better get on board because he was the answer that we've been waiting for. All right? And so this is the words of Jesus. I just chose to use some of Jesus' words to describe how the message of the cross works. One other thing, you know, people say, well, but you know, how can you say that this little tiny country on the globe is the answer for the whole world? Listen to me. You may not like the way God chose to do it, but this is the way God chose Amen. to do it. He picked a people. He created a nation out of one man. And through that nation, he gave a man. And through that man, Christ Jesus, he saved entirety of man. Amen. And if you don't like it, guess what? And he makes it a, it's a thing of faith. And you and I are going to have to choose whether or not we're going to believe. And that's exactly what he does. He confounds the wise. Hallelujah. He uses small things and turns them into great things. Think about the odds that the church would even thrive in the Roman Empire. How in the world does such a thing happen? Great Nero and the great Caesars of the world conquering the entirety of the world. And these little fishermen and shepherd men and tax collectors that have no strength in their own. But yet God would use them to transform the entirety of the globe. No, this is the gospel. This is the plan. And look what Jesus said. Jesus said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man be lifted up. The next verse talks about him. Once he is, he will draw all men unto him. Listen to me. You remember the story about Moses and the serpent? If you don't, let me help you. In Moses and the serpent, the people were murmuring and complaining, and the Lord got angry with them, and he sent serpents to bite them, and they were getting sick. And Moses cries out to the Lord. He said, I need you to get a brazen serpent and put it on a pole. Put a brazen serpent on a brazen pole on which it will lift it up. And if they'll look at that, then what they're going to do is they're going to be healed. Now listen, people have taken that. They've twisted it and messed it up. And listen, what you need to understand, Jesus wasn't a serpent, but he did take the sin of man on himself. He was raised up on a pole. That's what it's talking about. If you lift him up. He was talking about being suspended between heaven and earth. Amen. He said, when you lift up the son of man, when you suspend him between heaven and earth, he's going to draw all men unto you. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that it's a it's a timeless. uh, It's an it's an eternal message. Just the same. Moses is lifting up the serpent was just a type of what Jesus came to fulfill and that Jesus had to die on the cross in order for it to all be fulfilled, in order for it to all be enacted. It goes on to say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the next one, John 14. 17 through 18 says even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not neither knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you he says I will not leave you comfortless I will come to you now he's saying a lot right here but, but one of the things he's saying, first off, is that the world can't receive the spirit of truth because they can't see him. Now, you can be in the world and you can receive the gospel and then you can receive the spirit of truth. But the world system out there that's being ruled and ran by the devil can't see the truth of God. But he says, but you know him for he says, but you know him, for he dwells with you and he shall be in you. Now, you got to understand who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to his disciples. What is the consistent thing that his disciples are? Nationality-wise, they're Jews. Jesus is talking to them in their own context, and what he's explaining is, is that the Holy Spirit of truth has been with you. What do you mean? Oh, well, yeah, we know that. See, they know that. We might not know that, but they know that. That's easy for them because they just remember, oh, yeah. Because they read the Bible all the time. They read the Old Testament all the time. Oh yeah, man, the presence of God. Spirit of God. Boy, he was with He was with Moses back in the Old Testament. He was with him. It is a cl- pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. 
Hallelujah. He was, he was the, the shaking in the mulberry trees. He was, he was the sling that held the rock that struck Goliath's head. I mean, they, you know, they're just thinking of all these stories of how God continuously showed up for those Old Testament characters. And what he's trying to say is, and not only that, this is the big one, really. That you're talking about the tabernacle, uh, Jesus. You're, you're the presence of God, the spirit of truth was with our people as we tra as they traveled in the wilderness journey and they'd set up that tent and behind that veil, the Lord's presence was right there between them cherubim on top of that mercy seat. God's presence, the spirit of truth was with the people. And Jesus said, but he's going to be in you. Amen. See that right there? He says, you know him for he dwells with you, but he will be in you. That's important stuff. I don't see the word cross right here, preacher. But let me tell you something. The only way the Holy Spirit was able to be changed from being with them to being in them was because Jesus paid the final fulfillment of the sin debt. The, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats... Old Testament sacrifices could not remove sin. It was a temporary measure that foretold of the day that Jesus would come, but Jesus fulfilled it when he died on the cross. Hallelujah. And when you got saved, let me tell you what happened. You might not have known this. Maybe a preacher never took the time, but let me take some time. This may have to turn into a two-part message. Whenever you got saved and you put your faith in Jesus, hallelujah, in the mind of God, the old man that was born of Adam, and born in sin, was taken by the Holy Spirit, and he was brought over here, and he was put in Christ. Well, let's go ahead and draw it. We used to draw it all the time, right? The old man born of Adam, broken and dead, was born of Adam. He heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is his crown of thorns and him crucified. And through faith in his sacrifice and the fact that he was the answer that God gave. Well, I didn't know all that exactly, preacher. All you needed to know is that you were, you were a sinner and Jesus died for you. That's what you needed to know. All right? And when that happened in God's mind, you rushed back 2,000 years in time. Hallelujah. And to this place called Calvary. And at that point in time, you were placed in Jesus. You died with him at the cross. You were buried with him in the tomb. And now you've been resurrected to newness of life. I used to do that all the time with this thing. That's all I, mean. I told you all that before. Right, I used to go to other people's church. Now I'm trying to explain it to them. I get one shot with them. I've been pre teaching this you for three years. And if we're honest with each other, we still don't understand like we need to. I got one shot with them. I got to tell them. Old man born of Adam. He's over here. Okay. Old man born of Adam. Dead. Broken. Separated from God. Hears the gospel message. Believes it by faith. Holy Spirit takes him. Hallelujah. Translates him over here to a new place where he dies. This is a sideways grave. He dies with Jesus. The old man dies. The old man dies with Jesus, but the new man is resurrected to newness of life, yes. and now he's in Christ. Hallelujah. A new position. This is all spiritual. This is how God sees it. Yes. Whether you see it or feel it or not, it, this is what the Word of God teaches. Yes. The old. This is the message of the cross. This is the mysteries of of God. This is what was hidden beforehand in the Old Testament scriptures that was revealed when Jesus came and died on the cross. This is the revelation that Paul got when the Lord revealed it to him. This is why he was so excited and willing to take a whooping on his back and get beat on his head with rods and get thrown into prison and still in Philippians write the word joy multiple times because the joy he was getting revelation. Man, this is so big. And what have he known that we would still be here today and we be reading the writings that the Lord God gave him? I don't know, but he knew it was big. And he's writing these things about what Jesus is talking about. But what I need you to know is right now what I'm trying to tell you is that's what happened. Yes. Yes. With you, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, you're going to lift up the son of man. You're going to put him on a cross. He's going to die for the sins of mankind. And then he's going to draw men unto you. And the spirit of truth who the world doesn't know, you know him because he's been with you, but he's going to be in you. Yeah. 
Because when I go to the cross and I pay the penalty for the sins of mankind and they place their faith in me, then now my spirit is going to, the spirit of God is going to reside in them. He's going to live in them. He's going to be their God and they're going to be his people. But then look at this. John chapter 16. Verses 13 through 14. Because look. We need the mysteries of God revealed. Amen. Amen. We need the mysteries of God revealed to us. And this is what Jesus said. <clears throat> How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come. Now, look, Jesus told him this in this John book. He says, I'm going away to my father. He said, but it's a good thing. It's expedient. It's a good thing that I go away because if I don't go, then he won't come. Who's he? The comforter. The Holy Spirit. He said, how be it when the spirit of truth has come, he's going to guide you in all truth. It's a beautiful thing to be a, be a child of God. Yes. It's a beautiful thing to have studied the Word of God and to have the Holy Spirit within our heart, amen, oh, yes. and for God to be able to speak to us and lead us and guide us yes. through the amen. steps and the journeys and the valleys of life, amen. Yes. Yes. But whatsoever He will hear, talking about the Spirit of truth, this is what He does, I'm sorry, He says He will guide you in all truth. He will not speak of Himself. One thing that you need to understand about the person of the Holy Spirit, He doesn't teach about Himself. He, that's not his ministry. I'm not saying he, he will never reveal aspects of his person. His ministry is to teach us Jesus. This is what it, I didn't write this. this. is Jesus. He's not going to speak of himself. He's not going to take what he wants to say and just say it. No. He's, it, there's perfect unity in the Godhead. Amen. And the perfect unity of the Godhead, the Father says, I want Jesus on the forefront of the stage. That's why I know Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. Because all they want to talk about is Jehovah. And they don't even know Jehovah is Jesus. And then you start mentioning the name of Jesus. That's when I told one of them the other day in a parking lot a while back. I'm like, the problem that I got with what you talk about, dude, is every time I mention Jesus, all you want to do is come back and say Jehovah. And what I'm trying to say is, is that the Father said it pleased him. Hallelujah, that all things be put under his feet and that he get the preeminence. And all I keep talking here, you talking about, you, you keep putting lower than him. And I'm here to tell you that the gospel picks him up. The gospel elevates him. The gospel puts him on the forefront. The Holy Spirit puts him on the forefront and says, Hey, all you who are thirsty and need living water, come and drink of the fountain of life. Come and partake of the plan of God, Amen. which was the sending of his son Jesus. He's not going to speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, that's what he's going to speak. He will show you things to come. He will glorify me. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. Amen. That's how you know if somebody's preaching truth or not. Is Jesus being glorified in the service? I didn't say they said his name. Are they glorifying him? Or are they glorifying self? Are they glorifying people's problems? Sometimes we glorify our problems. Sometimes the preacher glorifies himself. We need to glorify Jesus. Amen? He's the answer to the problems. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. He will show you things that come. He will glorify me. Look at this. He shall receive of mine. The Holy Spirit is going to take of what is Jesus. His work. His person. Who he is. What he did. And what's he going to do? He's going to show it unto you. They, he showed it to Paul. Yeah. He showed the mysteries of God to Paul. And so ultimately, I'm actually closing with this particular message uh, this morning. It was a lot longer, but I'm not going to do that. And maybe we'll pick, pick it up next time. Maybe we won't. I was, I, I was hoping that we were going to do communion, so we're going to try to do it next week. But listen, the connection between the message of the cross and the Holy Spirit is revealed through these phrases. We're going to lift up Jesus. Amen. On the cross. He's going to die for the sins of mankind. The spirit of God because of that. Is now able to live inside of man. And guess what? The presence of the Holy Spirit. Is going to be able to reveal the mysteries of God to people. Now listen. Paul was a steward of the mysteries of God. What in the world does that have to do with you today? I mean my daughter is big enough. She's going to pick on you. Sierra what does this have to do with you? I mean we're talking about the apostle Paul. Mom, what does this have to do with you? We're talking about the Apostle Paul. Preacher, what does this have to do with you? You sure ain't the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was entrusted with the mysteries 
of God. But I need you to understand all true believers are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all true believers have been entrusted with the mysteries of God, the message of the cross, because all true believers are like that steward that was in that parable that we talked about. Every last one of us have been entrusted with a portion of the mysteries of God. And, and, and this is the purpose of our life. The purpose of our life on this earth. Listen, God will take care of the things that we go through. The enemy is trying to distract us with all of the valleys and all of the things that are going on in our lives. And there's going to be down days. But let me tell you something. Keep our eyes on the Lord. Keep trusting in him and keep on moving forward in the battle, Christian soldier, because this is what we've been called to do. And that is how it affects you. And that is how it applies to your life. You are a steward and a servant of the mystery of God. You might not be called to preach behind a pulpit, but let me tell you something. You are called to let the light of God shine Amen. out of you and That's into true. other people's lives.